Shabbat Shalom, Chabrim, and what a pleasure it is to speak with you guys during this uh, Hanukkah celebration we're having, and it is very much a blessing. I hope that you've enjoyed some of the music that we've posted, some of the little teachings from Chabad.org uh, that we've shared with you as well, so that you can get a feel for what the Chabad story really is about, about the Maccabees and how they overcame, and how uh, when during the times of the Greek uh, the Greek conquering Israel back about, gosh, about 300 years before the 150 years or 160 years before Yeshua, etc. But anyway, uh, we're going to definitely touch on the Hanukkah story, uh, hopefully tomorrow during the daytime for Shabbat uh, Live. And uh, so I hope you're able to join us for Shabbat Live. Be here, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time in the, in the United States. I uh, believe that's 6 p.m. in Israel. Uh, and from there, you guys have to figure out the rest. So, at any rate, um, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Now, I've got about three different Bibles laid out before me. Um, and there's really not any difference. So if you're using a King James, you can use a King James. If you're using uh, uh, something different, that's okay as well. Uh, it's pretty much going to be the same no matter which way you read it. But chapter 7, this is the famous scripture, what so many people like to run to and say, don't judge me, because God will judge you if you judge me. But what I'm going to speak to you about is totally different than what you probably ever thought about this scripture before. So I hope it's a blessing for you. Okay, verse 1, judge not lest you be judged. With what judgment you judge and with what measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, keep that verse 2 in your mind. We're going to come right back to it. Why do you see the straw in the eye of the other person, but not the beam in your own eyes? I'm actually reading from the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Uh, how is it that you say to the other person, wait for me a while while I cast out the straw out of your eye, eyes, excuse me, behold the, uh, and behold the beam is in your own eyes. Hypocrite, first cast the beam out of your own eyes, and afterwards will you be able to cast the straw out of the eye of your fellow man? Now, like I said, I've heard this scripture quoted so many times by different believers over the years, especially those that are not trying to even live a godly life will use that and say, you're not supposed to be judging me or else God will judge you. Well, it's kind of interesting because that there's some truth in that. Actually, verse 2, I believe, is prophetic. So let's look at verse 2 again. With what judgment you judge and with what measure you, you, you use it will be measured to you. Now, that is a powerful scripture right there. But if it's prophetic... Because God is talking to, here Jesus, excuse me, Jesus is talking to, to the Jewish people of his day, and he's telling them, with what judgment you judge and with what measure you use, it will be measured to you. Well, who are the ones that judged Yeshua? It was the Jews of his day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the ones that judged him and condemned him to death. So therefore, that judgment that they use against Yeshua, he is going to take and come back and use the same judgment against them. And is it biblical? Is it prophetic? Yes, it is. And Yeshua goes even further to state what it is. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 26, beginning around verse 58. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what, for the King James people, I will read just right from there. Um, I would read them all from there, but it takes me forever to find the places when I don't mark them. All right, uh, verse 57. And they that, excuse me, and they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off into the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought, sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Remember, by what judgment you judge, you will be judged. By what the measure you use, the way, what is that measure? Let's go back and look at that again. Let's look at that 
Think of the scripture there in Matthew 7. Think of it from a prophetic standpoint, okay? Think of it like that. With what judgment you judged and with what measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, the judgment which was condemning Christ to death. Then he says, and with what measure you use. In other words, what is the way that you're going to do this? How are you going to levy this judgment? Now we find out exactly how they do it. Jesus prophesies of it. And then he says it's going to come back on them the exact same way. So let's look at that here. So they said, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Hmm. It's pretty much the way they're doing it today, isn't it? All kinds of false witnesses out there. Now, verse 60, but they found, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. Let me just stop there for a moment. It's just like in t today. There's many false witnesses out there. Many are coming. But that's not what they were looking for. Let's see what they look for. At the last came two false witnesses. Isn't that interesting? By what measure you judge, it will be measured to you. The measure we might say is like a space. In this case here, a numerical measure. There were two. There were two false witnesses brought against Yeshua. But see, Yeshua is the truth. He's the word. He's the word of life. He's the son of God. He's the almighty unveiled in a human body. And so therefore he spoke in prophecy as Matthew records it in the seventh chapter. By what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And by what measure, in other words, in the way that you do it, it will be done to you. So they find two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest rose and said unto him, answer thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses witness against thee. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, let's look into the future. Let's look even into the day we're living. We know clearly, according to Revelation 11, that there are two witnesses coming. Now, according to Revelation 11, though, these two witnesses are not the false ones. These two witnesses are going to be the fulfillment of Yeshua's own words from his own mouth in Matthew 7. See? With what judgment you judge and with what measure you use, it will be measured to you. They used two false witnesses. They judged him based on two false witnesses. And so here in the closing hours, God is going to judge them with true, two true witnesses. Not false witnesses in a case like this here, but two witnesses that God will bring on the scene to judge not just the Jews, because remember, it wasn't just the Pharisees and Sadducees here. Because Rome was the executioner. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the judge. And the measure also was the fact that they used Rome to put him to death. So therefore, Yeshua sends in this day we're living in now, he's going to send two true witnesses. Now, many will come claiming they are, but they're not the ones. But there's going to come two that are true. Revelation 11 states right here, 
And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Isn't it interesting just the wording there? Measure the temple, measure the altar, leave out the outer court. It's given unto the Gentiles, which we know that's exactly the way they're going to do it. With what measure you use. Now, the very judgment against Yeshua was that if he tore down the temple, he could build it in three days. Here they are, starting off right before the two witnesses are spoken about, measuring out the temple, the altar. Because why? Rome is going to help the Temple Institute to build a third temple. Is it going to be the temple of God? I don't think so. But it would be a temple that the Antichrist would like to use. Now God may accept the building of it, but he's also going to bring it down. Let's look at it a little further. But the court which is without, we already read that, verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. Hmm. With what judgment you judge, and by what measure you measure, it will be judged unto you. Did I read that right? With what judgment you judge, and with what measure you use, it will be measured to you. They use two false witnesses against him. He sends two true witnesses to witness against them. Now, when I say against them, you have to remember, 144,000, I know there's two different doctrines. There's one doctrine that says 144,000 are going to be uh, the men that will come along and they will win uh, over Israel. The scripture clearly says 144,000 were sealed. They're sealed in their foreheads, just like the Christian is sealed. See, we could go into that a little bit deeper, but I, I don't have the, have the notes laid out for me for that. There's something I'd love to tell you about that seal that they receive. It is the Holy Ghost, but it's also the revealing of God's divine name to them. That's what comes with it. I'll try to find it maybe before we close on this. But anyway, let me take you back to what, what happens here. You have to remember, 144,000, let's say it's literally, that's the number that God is going to seal of the mankind that is on the earth, both men and women and children being in that group. The virginity only shows, as I showed to you recently, and I believe it's in uh, Jeremiah chapter, what is it, 31 or 29, something like that. It's, Israel is that virgin because she's not caught up with the doctrines of the church and the world. They didn't, they didn't sell out to the Vatican like many priest uh, uh, rabbis have today in Israel or like the politicians that have sold out in Israel. They didn't sell out like that. That's why they're called virgins. It's about 7% of the population of the Jews that are in Israel today, 144,000. It is a remnant. It is a small group. He only comes for a remnant, even according to Paul's writing over in the book of Romans chapter 11. A remnant. And it says deliverance will come out of Zion. Hmm. A lot about Zion. I had somebody criticize me not long ago when I told about the dream that the Lord showed me. And the Lord spoke to, my, spoke to me and wrote it on a rock in front of me. There's a man drinking here on my holy mountain and you're to remove him. People said Mount Zion is not God's holy mountain. Well, in his word, he calls it his holy mountain. So I guess it is holy to God. Uh, I know Mount Moriah is where the temple sits and sat. I understand that. But Mount, Mount Zion also means a great deal to the Lord as well. All right, so anyway, uh, the two witnesses, I give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before God of the earth, and identifies them to be the same two over in Zechariah. Isn't it interesting how long they prophesy? Do you know they prophesy Basically, in God's timing, three and a half days. Well, Yeshua, they accused him and said that if he tore down the temple, I'd build it back up in three days. Isn't it interesting? Yeshua is going to build Israel. They, the, see, the, <clears throat> you are the temple of God. 
You as an individual, Gentile or Jew, if you believe that Yeshua is Messiah, you are that temple. He sends two witnesses on the scene. And what do they do? They're going to build back the temple. Not talking about the temple made with hands. They're going to build that 144,000. They're going to build a righteous branch unto God. See, the Gentile, you've already been built. You're already part of that temple. Yeshua said, tear it down. And in three days, I'll build it back up. Well, we know the Bible says he's clearly talking about his own body. In three days, he did raise up. But there's a compound fulfillment in that scripture right there. What is it? Also with Israel, the ones that have been dead, the ones that have been blind, who've been dead for now for 2,000 years. He sends two witnesses on the scene. And in three and a half years, he raises them back up. A temple under the Lord. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I take that from the, uh, there's another scripture where, where a, a year represents a day. So just a, just a thought, just a thought for you to think about. I don't want to doctrinize this, uh, but just uh, some similarities I see in the scripture. All right, and, uh, now it says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut the heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascend out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them kill them okay now their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt where also our Lord was crucified and and they of the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves that's twofold right there they see their dead bodies and that might be because of newscast but it also may be because they have made Jerusalem a city for all nations which is exactly what they're going to do as they divide the land I've told you already, I heard it myself from, from a lead person out of the United Nations in Israel tell me Israel's going back to the pre-1967 borders. It's already set. It's already planned. It's just a, it just has to be implemented. So they don't suffer their dead bodies. And they dwell upon the earth, shall rejoice over them, send gifts one to another, because they two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Uh, on the earth and after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet a great fear fell upon them which saw them and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up into heaven in a cloud and the enemies beheld them and the same hour was there a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrightened and gave glory to God of heaven the second woe is past and behold the third woe cometh quickly now let me tell you something. This is such a blessed thing. Let me tell you a couple of things. The people out there that claim to be one of the witnesses already, remember, Yeshua spoke clearly. Many witnesses had come. Matthew writes about it. Many had already come, but they weren't the two. Remember, there were two true, true, two true false witnesses against Yeshua. And just like it is in this day, God is going to bring two true witnesses to testify against Rome and the religious Jews that have turned their back on God and sold out to Rome. But in the process, there will be many that come, but they're not the ones. If you say that you're bringing out plagues, turning the water to blood, I know men that have said this. Not just one, I know several of them. There's lots of them out there already claiming these things. No, sir, it's not so. They come on the scene together. The world knows about them. They're in Israel. These things are happening from Israel, not from some other part of the world. From Israel. When their ministry begins, believe me, the world will know what's going on. You'll see a revival begin in Israel as well. Not amongst the whole nation, amongst the little remnant that are believing. The remnant were frightened. Those that hated them were not frightened. They, but when they, when they rose up, Tenth part of the city fell. I have a feeling right where they build their little false temple, it's going down. It's going down. And what are they doing? They're witnessing that Yeshua, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, was absolutely 100% 
on the dot. I'd say another, another identity of the two witnesses, they will know God's divine name. It won't be Yehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh, whatever you want to call it and everything. It is a name that is given. They're sealed. The 144,000 are sealed with the Holy Ghost and given this name. A pure language is restored to them where they may be able to worship God by his name. The name Yeshua was the greatest name that ever was on this earth. Because it was God manifested in a human body. This is why it's interesting that God's divine name, the, the pronunciation was lost not long after Yeshua left the scene. Because his name became exalted. And as he comes back and completes redemption, then Israel begins to worship the God of Israel, the very God that married them in the wilderness journey. Now, let's go a little further here. I want to share with you some more things here. I want to take you over to Obadiah, because we're not done with these witnesses here. Odd place for two witnesses, believe it or not, but it's right in Obadiah as well. Let's go to Obadiah 1, chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 18. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. They shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be anything remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. I've already proven to you. You can go back and read the book of Obadiah. You'll see that Esau are the Romans, are the descendants of Esau. God clearly identifies them. He says, you were the ones that stood in the way while uh, the temple was being destroyed. You're the ones that kept them from going anywhere. Titus, the Roman general, uh, he, had, he had confederated with Syria which the Syrians are from Hulda. Hulda was of the royal house of Esau. Uh, they became later the Romans. So they worked together. They're brothers. Of course, that's why the Vatican and the Muslims work together. They're brothers. You know, it's funny today. I've seen a flag at an embassy. Look, like an American flag. It had red and white stripes. I still don't know what country it is yet. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. But on the, on the part where the stars are for the United States, this flag here had... A picture of the sun and the moon. And I'm thinking, and, and, the, and the address of the place was 666. I like to fell out laughing. I said, there it is. The Vatican, sun worship, and the moon, moon worship. You know, they serve the sun god. You know, they're a little kosher wafer and everything. And of course, they've united with the Muslim world. And, and the United States happens to be their military wing. Got the stars, and, or excuse me, the stripes of the, of the United States flag. And here they are at 666. I thought that was so interesting. I got to find out what country does that. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, will tell me because I haven't had a chance to look yet. Anyway, God bless you. All right, let's continue on real quick. So Obadiah says right here, and they, verse 19, they south shall possess the mount of Esau and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead and the captivity of the host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even into uh, Zarephath and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is uh, uh, Sephar, Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south and deliverers shall come up on Mount Zion. I think in the King James, you write uh, saviors. Uh, Hebrew, we'd call it deliverers. It could, you could still use the word saviors. Shall come up upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Did you hear what he just wrote there? For one, it's plural. There's more than one deliverer. Well, there's more than one witness. There's two of them. He comes up on where? Mount Zion. To judge the Mount of Esau. What did Rome do? What did Israel do? Israel allowed the Romans, they allowed the Pope of Rome a seat on Mount Zion at the place of the Last Supper, which is King David's tomb, to crown him as King of Israel. And he says, on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. They come up to Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is when it's all being done. I mean, I really don't see how people miss this. I really have, I can't, for the life of me, I don't see how people can miss this. Mm. So they said in Matthew 26, but found the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. It is, you know, it's just incredible how God just hides so many things in his word. It never, never 
ceases to amaze me of God's incredible word. Let me real quick, I'll pause just for a second. Let me see if I can find that part about the ceiling. Okay, I got it right here for you. Revelation 14, 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Isn't that interesting? What, what is that right there? He has revealed the divine name of God. It's been revealed to that, that little group at 144,000. It was revealed to them. And they stood upon Mount Zion. Incredible, isn't it? Anyway, God bless you. We love you. And happy Hanukkah. Chag Sameach, we say uh, in, in Hebrew. And uh, be, just be blessed. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at Shabbat Live tomorrow evening. I'm going to try to figure out how to put that link on, either on our website or, or uh, on, um, on our Facebook page so you can see that. I don't know when I'll get around to putting that up, but I'll try to get that up for you guys. And, uh, and pray for us. We thank you. We thank you for those of you that, that support this ministry. We thank you for those, whether it's by your prayers, your financial contributions as well, because you're the ones that make it happen. You're the ones that make it possible. And I believe that what you're doing is preparing a way for the Jewish people. Any ministry that's for the Jewish people is a road, a path being paved for them. And so I thank God for you and for what you're doing. And by the way, too, if you're out there and you know another language and you would like to translate, or I, I mentioned this once before, there were several sisters out there that uh, were transcribers. I do want to try to get some of the shorter messages transcribed. And I'd like to see if we can't get some of those translated into other languages. There are so many people from around the world that are asking for this, and I just don't have the ability or, or, the, or the knowledge or anything to do that. So God bless you. We thank you, and thank you again for, for your contributions to this ministry. Shalom, and Shabbat Shalom. Good night.